Well, hello. This is chapter five of your positioning book, and today we are going to be talking about the shoulder girdle and the views that we take to demonstrate the shoulder joint. When we look at the shoulder girdle, it's typically made up of the clavicle, the scapula, and the humerus, because those bones help form the actual shoulder joint or shoulder girdle. When we look at the proximal humerus, there's so many parts to this. And again, anatomy is so vital to know, um, not only to know your anatomy, but to be able to apply that radiographically and look at um, parts on a radiograph and be able to know what position your patient's in, um, what anatomy is being demonstrated, if it's properly demonstrated or not. So on the proximal humerus, you have the humeral head, and then the humerus actually has two necks. It has an anatomic neck, which is up here, and it has a surgical neck, which is below here. It has a greater tubercle, which sticks out in our external view of the shoulder, and then it has a lesser tubercle, which sits more anteriorly. This one sits, greater tubercle sits more laterally, lesser tubercle sits more anterior. And then in between the two tubercles, you have the intertubercular groove or the bicipital groove. And then we have the deltoid tuberosity, which is where the deltoid muscle attaches. And this is the body or the shaft of the humerus. So all of this is what helps make up the shoulder joint. The head of the humerus sits in the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa of the scapula. When we look at the joints of the shoulder girdle, we actually have the scapulohumeral joint or the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint. Everything we have seems to have three names. So again, head of the humerus sits in the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa of the scapula. That's one joint. And then we have the acromioclavicular joints or the AC joints. And then we have SC joints or sternoclavicular joints between the sternum and the clavicle, between the acromion process of the scapula and the acromial end of the clavicle. So we have those three joints that make up in the shoulder girdle. When we look at the joints of the shoulder girdle, they're actually synovial joints, meaning they have synovial fluid and they're diarthroidal. So again, we have radiographically, you have the scapulohumeral joint, between the scapula, the glenoid cavity, or glenoid fossa of the scapula, and the humeral head of the humerus. And then you have the acromion process of the scapula, and the acromial end of the clavicle forms the AC joint. And then we have the sternal end of the clavicle, along with the sternum, makes up the SC joints. Remember, SC joints are where we look to see if a PA chest is rotated or not. You can look at the SC joints and make sure they're equidistant, equally open. And then AC joints is something we'll talk about later on where we actually image these because a lot of times it's um, a sports injury that takes place and we actually have specific views to demonstrate the AC joints. Then we're going to be looking at the scapulohumeral joint. When we look at the movement types of the shoulder girdle joints, again, the scapulohumeral joint is a spheroidal or ball and socket. So it provides much greater freedom of movement. Um, your, your arm can actually move uh, in a circular motion, can go in all different kinds of directions, assuming there's no injury. And then your SC joints and your AC joints are plane joints or gliding joints. This is something that is not in your positioning book. This is just something I added in, which is an excellent representation of all the different parts of the humerus, um, all the different parts of the shoulder girdle, the clavicle, and the scapula. You can see on here, it demonstrates where the first rib is. You can see the clavicle on here. You can make out the SC joint between the sternum and the clavicle. You can see the medial border of the scapula come down here, the inferior angle of the scapula, the lateral border of the scapula right here. And then we've got the coracoid process on the scapula, the acromion process of the scapula, 
and then you've got the AC joint. This is the acromial end of the clavicle articulating with the acromion process of the scapula. You've got the humeral head right here, the anatomical neck, which comes down here, greater tubercle, intertubercular groove, lesser tubercle, and surgical neck down here. Glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity of the scapula. And then this is the body or the shaft of the humerus. And then you've got up here the superior board of the scapula and then the superior angle. Just an excellent radiographic representation of all of our anatomy of the shoulder girdle. Um, very important to understand what you're looking at radiographically, knowing whether or not a joint is open or not and what you can do to correct that, knowing what specific joints we're looking at, whether it's AC joint or SC joint or the glomerular joint. Just very important, excellent representation of that. Now, when we look at the shoulder girdle, as far as technical factors, we actually have four views of the shoulder that we do routinely. We have an external rotation, an internal rotation, a Gracie view, and a Y lateral. As you can see, um, for the internal, the external, and the gray sheet, we use 75 kVp at four mass. And for the Y lateral, because the positioning is a little bit different and you're going through a little bit more, we actually use 80 kVp at 7.5 mass. We are on a grid for this, whether you're doing them upright at the wall bucky, which is a little bit easier on the patient typically because they're not putting pressure on the shoulder. But if they're unable, it is okay to do it on the table bucky. Just realize your patient is gonna be lying on that shoulder and sometimes that can be painful. So we need a grid because the shoulder on an adult is typically greater than 10 centimeters. We use a high MA and a short exposure time focal spot ideally. If you're going to use AEC, which is automatic exposure control, you're going to be on center chamber and we use a 40 inch SID. The first view we do is the external rotation and that is actually found on page 191 of your book. And on the external rotation, this is um, when you look on, on page 191, um, you can see the patient is standing upright at the chessboard so that she's not applying pressure to her shoulder, assuming there is an injury. The patient is shielded, which we can shield all patients for the shoulder. 40-inch um, SID. And then the patient is standing in a, in this case, an erect position. She's going to abduct the arm slightly. And she's going to externally rotate the arm. She's going to supinate her hand until the epicondyles of the distal humerus are parallel to the IR. Now, we talked about this when we do elbow as well. So you're going to palpate the epicondyles, the medial and lateral epicondyle, and you're going to make sure that they're parallel to the IR, which in most cases means that the patient's hand is supinated. So slightly away from the body, supinate the hand until the epicondyles are parallel to the IR. The central ray is perpendicular and it is directed one inch inferior to the coracoid process. Okay, now the coracoid process, if you push on the coracoid process, it's extremely uncomfortable for them. Um, if you were to palpate on yourself right up in this area, a little bit above where the central ray is, about an inch above, and you rub really hard on that. A lot of times, um, if you poke somebody in there, it really can make them mad. It's just it, not a lot of skin over that. It sticks out, and it's not, it's not comfortable for someone to rub on that. Now, central ray is one inch below or inferior to the coracoid process, which is somewhat difficult to palpate. So typically, you can find that area two inches below mid-clavicle. So if you find the patient's mid-clavicle and go two inches below that, that will put you one inch below the coracoid process because the coracoid is found approximately one inch below mid-clavicle. So if you go 
two inches below midclavicle, that will put you one inch below the coracoid process. So technically speaking, central ray on an external shoulder is one inch below coracoid process. I'm just telling you that you can find them by finding midclavicle of the patient and going two inches below that. And in order to do this external rotation, you must demonstrate the entire clavicle, meaning the acromial end and the sternal end. You cannot clip. Um, on this particular image, it looks like um, they're kind of clipping the sternal end, and that cannot be the case. If you look at the images in your book, they actually are clipping the sternal end of the clavicle, and that is not acceptable. You have to demonstrate the entire clavicle. If we look at the radiograph of this, again, a chromial end of the clavicle is definitely there. Um, you've got the entire shoulder joint, but you have to also include the sternal end of the clavicle. So in this particular image, we would need it, the collimation to have been open slightly from side to side in order to capture that. And typically with these, we collimate to a 10 by 12 crosswise. Again, our IRs are either 14 by 17, 16 by 16. So you collimate approximately to a 10 by 12 crosswise so that you can capture. Now this appears like it's a 10 by 12 lengthwise, but you would actually open the collimation a little bit more this way and you could afford to lose some of this down here. Okay, since we're looking at shoulder joint, we want the entire shoulder joint, some of the shaft of the humerus, but the entire clavicle. So collimate to a 10 by 12 crosswise. And that is our external rotation of the shoulder. Okay, when we look at the anatomy, you can see on here, um, I've labeled this for you, that A is the humeral head, B is the greater tubercle, which on this, that's what on the external it places the greater tubercle in profile. You've got the intertrabecular groove, the lesser tubercle, the anatomic neck, this line running right here, and then you've got the surgical neck, which is right here, and the body or the shaft of the human. So if we look back at that radiograph, this right here is the greater tubercle, and on the external rotation, it places the greater tubercle in profile. If you look on your cheat sheet for week two, you'll notice on your shoulder it has an acronym, G-E-L-I. In the G-E, G stands for greater tubercle, and the E is for external rotation. So the greater tubercle is in profile on the external rotation, so you find it laterally. So on the left shoulder, greater tubercle is right here. Let me try and draw that for you. So right here is the greater tubercle in profile. Okay, and that's found on the external. Again, right here. Greater tubercle is in profile on the external. Then we do the internal rotation, and this is found on page 192. All you do simply tell the patient to hold still after you make the exposure, which is done on exhalation. Pretty much you, you can have them breathe in or out. Typically, you just have them suspend their breathing so that they're not moving during the exposure. So inspiration or expiration is fine, just typically not breathing while you make the exposure. So all they do for this particular view, from the last view, if we go back and look at that real quick, on the external, you notice her hand is supinated. When we go to the internal rotation, all the patient is going to do is simply turn their hand so that the um, top of the hand is against the back of their thigh, okay? Top of their hand right against the thigh. So they internally rotate the arm to place the top of the hand 
against their thigh. Okay, we should still be collimated to 10 by 12 crosswise. Nothing really changes between the exposure, so ideally your patient held still. You want to make sure now, instead of um, the epicondyles parallel, now the epi epicondyles are actually going to be perpendicular. Remember when we internally rotate the hand like this, it actually places the humerus in a lateral position. Okay places the humerus in a lateral position when you internally rotate the hand. So now the epicondyles are going to be perpendicular and your central ray doesn't change at all. It's still one inch below the coracoid, which is found two inches below clavicle. So literally all your patient did from that first exposure to the second is internally rotate their hand. That's the only change that's made. Same central ray same marker, shielding is the same. All they did was take their hand from supinated to internally rotate it and put the top of their hand against their thigh, All right? And you make the exposure on suspended respiration. And again, you want to demonstrate the entire clavicle, which this does not. This actually cuts off the sternal end again because this is collimated 10 by 12 lengthwise and we would collimate 10 by 12 crosswise for this. Now the arrow that I put in here, this is actually demonstrating the lesser tubercle. And I feel like I have to kind of highlight that because it's a little bit hard to see on here, but this is it right here. That is the lesser tubercle gets put in profile medially on this. So lesser tubercle is profiled medially. So on the greater, tubercle. Remember, it is put in profile laterally on this one, on the external, and then on the internal rotation, you're actually profiling the lesser tubercle medially. I'll get rid of that so you can see it again. Now that I've outlined it, it's right here. So the internal rotation demonstrates the lesser tubercle in profile. All right, and the only thing wrong with this is again, we need to include the sternal end of that clavicle. So now we've done our external rotation and our internal rotation. The next image we do is actually called a Gracie method. And the Gracie is actually on page 196. And this demonstrates the glenoid cavity. It actually opens the scapulohumeral joint. Okay, that's the whole purpose. So what we do, the patient is placed into a 35 to 45 degree posterior oblique. So she's either going to be in an RPO or an LPO. They're posterior obliques. So 35 to 45 degree oblique. Patient is still shield shielded. And the central ray is perpendicular to the IR, and it is placed two inches below, so two inches below, and two inches medial from the superolateral border of the humerus. Okay, so I said it's two in and two down. So you find the top of the shoulder, and you're going two inches in and two inches down which places it at about the same place you were for the internal and external, except now the patient is oblique. Okay, so from the shoulder, two inches down and two inches medial. And that's where your X marks the spot is. Okay, two inches down, two inches down, two inches in, puts it in about the same place as you were for your other images. It's just, it looks a little bit odd just because um, of the way she's oblique, but you can see axillas right here. So they're about two inches in from the lateral border and two inches down from the top of the shoulder. Now, the whole point of this is to open the joint space. You have to open the joint space. So when we look at this, just from 
um, this drawing is actually on page 196, what they're showing you is they can't show you the two down, but when they're coming two inches in from the lateral border, that's ideally placing you right in the dead center of the scapulohumeral joint. So in theory, you're going to come, the central ray is going to cut right between the glenoid cavity and the humeral head and open that joint space. And they show you that if the patient is in a 35 to 45 degree oblique and that central ray is placed perpendicular to that open joint space, then radiographically, what you should end up with is a perfectly open joint space between the humeral head and the glenoid cavity. And that's all I was trying to do with those arrows. To show you. This is a perfect Gracie view. Nice open joint space. You can see the joint space is not very big, but complete open all the way from top to bottom. And that's exactly what you want your image to look like. So the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa is in profile. The scapulohumeral joint is centered. And this is beautiful technical factors. The only thing that is wrong, again, you're missing the sternal end of the clavicle because this should be collimated 10 by 12 crosswise, not lengthwise. <clears throat> and the exposure is made on suspended respiration. Okay, so you're two inches down from the top of the shoulder and two inches in from the lateral border of the shoulder, which should put you dead center of the joint space and opens that joint space up. If you look on your cheat sheet, we then have um, a specialty view. And the specialty view is an axillary view, or it's called and this is not in your book. I do apologize. I did my best to get you an image of what this looks like. It's actually called a supero-inferior axillary view. Now, why supero-inferior? That's the projection because basically the central ray is coming, um, passing through the superior border, exiting the inferior border. So it's a supero-inferior axillary view. This is a specialty view. So the patient seated at the end of the table. The tube is then angled 5 to 15 degrees towards the elbow, and you tilt their head away from the shoulder in question, and ideally the IR is underneath their armpit. And what that does is kind of opens up this area in here, and it gives the, typically the orthopedic surgeons are the ones that like this view. Um, a lot of times you can have this when patients have dislocations of their shoulder or shoulder injuries. Now I can tell you this is not comfortable for a patient. It is very hard to have your arm extended yet pull your neck back this way. Um, not comfortable at all for the patient. And then you've got to capture the anatomy. So you've got to make sure your IR is underneath on the table in order to capture that. But I put it in here because a lot of times the orthopedic doctors like this view, so I want you to not have a clue what it looked like, and it is not in the Bontrager book. Um, it's actually in another positioning book, but I put this slide in just so you guys could see it, and I believe you have a handout also of um, the patient. It shows the patient seated like this, and it also shows the anatomy that we're looking at. So the last routine we view is actually called scapular Y view. And this is found on page 201. Okay, it's a PA oblique. Notice the patient is done PA. When you go out in the field, you will find that they tend to do these AP. Um, I don't teach you this way. The registry does not recognize that they're done AP, but I absolutely will tell you that they will do them AP. They will show you in the field how to do them AP. The problem when they do them AP is that there is such OID on the um, image. It's just really, really magnified. Um, but the registry does not recognize any kind of AP oblique projection. So this is a PA oblique. And notice I said that this is the only view that will show anterior posterior dislocation. So the 
is done to show fractures or dislocations of the proximal humerus and scapula. And this is the only one that will show you an anterior posterior dislocation. All the other ones are front to back. Um, so you're not really going to get that anterior, you're not going to simulate that third dimension. This is the only one that shows you that third dimension. The central ray, basically you place the patient um, PA and then you typically you try to put your hand on their scapula and you rotate the patient up until their scapula is perpendicular to the IR. She's just holding on to this bucky up here just to um, keep herself still so that she's not moving. So you rotate the patient until their scapula is perpendicular to the IR. And the body gets obliged anywhere from 45 to 60 degrees, totally dependent on the patient. Okay, you probably start at 45 and palpate the body of the scapula and see if it's actually perpendicular to the IR. And then kind of either raise or lower them as far as obliquity based on what the scapula feels like. And the central ray is to the proximal humerus and it is approximately two inches below the top of the shoulder and mid body of the scapula. It, it's kind of hard to see, but you can almost outline um, the body of her scapula is right here. You'll probably be able to feel the vertebral border of that. So you're centering two inches from the top of the shoulder to the mid body of the scapula. According to the book, your central ray is perpendicular to the IR, directed two inches below the AC joint. Okay, so the acromioclavicular joint is out here, two inches below the AC joint. But really, with this view, you're trying to pick, um, you're trying to like skim the scapula so that. What ends up happening is you have the humeral head sitting between the acromion process and the coracoid process. That's what you're trying to do is place the humeral head between the acromion and the coracoid process so that it actually forms a Y view. Okay, so here you have the Y. Here's the top of the Y and the body of the Y. Now that's all the scapula. And ideally the humeral head will sit um, in the middle of that. Okay, so you've got the acromion process right here. You've got the coracoid process over here. Okay, so the acromion and coracoid on the scapula. Then you've got the body of the scapula that forms the, um, the base of the Y and then humeral head right in the middle. So let's do that again. Okay, we've got the acromion process right here, coracoid process right here, base of the Y coming down like that. So you've got this, there's your Y, and then humeral head ideally sits in the middle of that. Okay, then I'll erase that. Then you can see on this one, it is completely dislocated because if we point that out again, you've got a chromium process here, coracoid process. So here's your Y. And notice humeral head is all the way over here. Now, when it comes towards the body like that, that's an anterior dislocation. Okay, it's coming this way. That's an anterior dislocation. This one no dislocation this is what it should like so look like I'm sorry humeral head in roughly in the center of the Y then you've got your Y being formed by the acromion process and the coracoid process and the body of the scapula and then humeral head roughly um, in the in the top of the Y but over here you've got acromion coracoid base of the Y and then humeral it is completely anteriorly dislocated because it's coming towards the body. Okay, so the body of the scapula should be superimposed on end, the acromion and coracoid are in profile, and the humeral head and glenoid cavity should be superimposed, and ideally good exposure factors. 
and the technique on this is a little bit more. It actually goes up. Um, you can see that with the patient obliged like that, and because of how we're going through, um, not nice and flat against it, you're going through a little bit more. So the technique on this is 80 kp at 7.5 mass for the Y view. Right, and this is done for fractures or dislocations, and it's the only one to show the anterior posterior aspect. And then I just wanted to point out, um, depending on where the fracture or dislocation is, depending on if the patient is able to position for that, um, that's great. If they're not, we could also do the transthoracic lateral of the proximal humerus. Remember where you the affected arm against the board and raise the unaffected arm. Do the same thing lying down, affected arm against the IR, unaffected arm raised. The central ray is perpendicular to the surgical neck because you're only trying to get proximal humerus on this. And you would utilize a breathing technique. Remember that orthostatic breathing where you set a low ray, long exposure time, and the patient keeps breathing throughout the exposure so that what you end up with is because they're breathing, it blurs out the lungs and the ribs, and you can actually make out the proximal humerus through the thoracic cavity. Okay, so you can see the proximal humerus, you can see the greater tubercle, lesser tubercle, head of the humerus up here, you can see the scapula, the shaft of the humerus. So that is potential if, if you severely suspected that they had a fracture or dislocation of the proximal humerus and they're unable to give you the Y lateral like this, you can have the patient stand or lie down and do a transthoracic, meaning you're going across the thorax for the lateral for that view. Okay, so again, the Y is made up of the acromion process, the coracoid process, and the base or the body of the scapula forms the base of the Y. And ideally, the humeral head sits um, in between where the Y comes together and the body of the scapula forms the base. When the head of the humerus is going toward the thoracic cavity, it's an anterior dislocation. If the humeral head was beyond the body of the scapula, that would be a posterior dislocation. And then again, we can do the transthoracic, which would give us a good visual of the um, proximal portion of the humerus. And that is pretty much all we do for the shoulder. For routine views, external rotation internal rotation, Gracie method to open that scapulohumeral joint, and a Y lateral to show any fractures or dislocations. The internal rotation places the lesser tubercle in profile. The external rotation places the greater tubercle in profile. Gracie opens the scapulohumeral joint space and the Y lateral shows any anterior or posterior dislocation. And then we also mentioned the axillary view, which is a specialty view that some orthopedics like to include. All right, we will meet up again and we'll discuss any questions or comments or concerns. Thank you.